Good afternoon uh, for the people here in Geneva, the Geneva Center for Security Policy, as well as those uh, people joining us uh, online from wherever, wherever you are uh, in the world. My name is Jamal Quickly. I'm Head of Global and Emerging Risk at, at the Geneva Center for Security Policy. And in the next hour, uh, we will talk about emerging technologies, the risk associated to these technologies, as well as the malicious uses and the governance that should be put in place in order to prevent uh, malicious uh, development. It's a great pleasure today to have with us three uh, scientists, three uh, fellows of the GCSB, they are Polymath Fellow. This, um, this um, webinar is organized during the Science and Diplomacy Week of uh, JESDA, the Geneva Science and Diplomacy uh, Accelerator. And uh, the Polymath Initiative is an initiative that has been uh, promoted and supported by the Didier and Martin Prima uh, Foundation. And the goal of this uh, initiative is actually to uh, break silos between discipline and uh, three fellows have been selected in artificial intelligence, uh, neurotechnologies, as well as synthetic biologies, and uh, they are exposed to global governance. And the goal is that by the end of the two-year fellowship, um, they will be translator, they will also be an influencer in the scientific community in the field of not just um, technologies, but the governance of technologies, uh, everything related to how the international uh, uh, community can uh, prevent malicious development in this field. So this afternoon, we have the great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, with us um, Dr. Sandra scott Herbert. Uh, she's a senior lecturer, associate professor at uh, the, the School of Electronics, uh, Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, and a member of the Center for Secure Information Technologies at Queen's University, uh, in uh, Belfast. She held several um, other uh, uh, appointments and she works in artificial intelligence, in network security, and she also has a background in uh, the corporate sector, notably in uh, uh, she received uh, uh, numerous uh, prizes and awards. And so if you can look uh, for her bio on our uh, website, uh, the Polymath uh, Initiative of uh, the Geneva Center for Security Policy. Uh, also today with us, we have uh, Dr. Kevin Esfeld. He is a specialist in uh, synthetic uh, uh, biology, the director of the Sculpting Evolution Group, which invents new ways to study and influence the evolution of ecosystem. He, um, he's based at the MIT lab in, uh, in Boston. And uh, basically, he has also numerous achievements, not the least, uh, he has been credited as the first to describe how CRISPR uh, genes drives could be used to alter the trait of white population in an evolutionary stable manner. And with us this afternoon here in Geneva, uh, Dr. Uh, Ricardo Chevaroyaga, he, he is a neuroscientist. He has more than 12 years experience in research on human machine interaction, brain machine interfaces, and AI. Uh, his work focused on the responsible development of technologies that promote beneficial human interaction between human and intelligent machine. He's actually he's, he's currently the head of the Swiss office of the Confederation of Laboratories for AI Research in Europe, Claire, and senior researcher at Zurich University of uh, Applied uh, Sciences, and also the chair of the IEEE Standard Association Industry Connection Group on Neurotech for Brain Machine Interfacing. So as you'll see uh, today, this afternoon, we have a very distinguished um, uh, panelist, and uh, the way we'll proceed is that each of the panelists will uh, speak for about 10-15 uh, minutes, and then we'll open the discussion, the floor for a uh, question and answer. And we will start uh, with uh, Ricardo. So, Ricardo, the floor and the screen is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Marc, and thank you for being here to you all uh, in presence and online to talk about emerging technologies, the impact that they may have in our society, and how can we approach uh, from a scientific, technological, but also from a governance perspective, the responsible innovation in these fields. <coughs> I hope this works. Uh, and let's start 
uh, acknowledging that we are at a point in time where we can leverage the benefits of technology to have impact in the world. And this impact can be significant, but can be at the same time positive or negative. So several years ago, while launching the space exploration, it was called like a new frontier, uh, that was the frontier of our planet. Uh, and I will start by talking about the new frontier is this frontier uh, with our brain, a system that previously uh, was something that we can, could see physically as an organ, but whose function was not well understood and not necessarily easy to interact with directly. We have, of course, interact with our brain through the natural means that uh, nature has, um, has provided by language, by movements, by behavior, but now we have new ways for doing so. And some of you uh, present here have had already this morning about two hours of the technologies. I will do my best not to enter into repetitive uh, arguments or into known territory. And I can assure that there are many, many things that haven't been covered yet and that we don't know yet. And we're still looking for answers. But let's start for the motivation for this type of research. It is obviously uh, health is one of the main challenges. How can we have uh, a health society, how can we can develop means for an aging society to counter cognitive and motor decline? And how can we also find treatments for so many uh, mental disorders or diseases for which we don't have any solution yet? And this is, of course, a very, um, very valuable uh, goal, but also has a strong economical impact and therefore has an interest from the private sector, from the public sector and governments on how to find solutions for doing so. And one way for doing it is by having these systems that allows us to measure, to interpret, to modulate, to change the activity of our nervous system, of our brain. And this can be through implanted electrodes, it can be inside in deep areas in our brain can be at the surface of our scalp in a non-invasive way with a bit of surgery can also be in through interaction with our peripheral nerves so there are different ways for creating this human machine interface this human machine loop where information will go from and to the human uh, with a machine and uh, i started the motivation talking about health-related uh, issues uh, and medical uh, <coughs> sector. But of course, there are other sectors that are well interested in this field. We can see consumer applications, interaction with autonomous systems. Can it be autonomous cars? Can be autonomous uh, vehicles in the large sense? Uh, for instance, drones that are developing warfare that, that leads us to another field of activity, which is the military domain. All these different fields are trying to use these technologies for specific purposes. All of them are ruled by different types of regulations and normatives. And none of this is currently um, well equipped to address all the challenges of a technology that is still under development. So a way for us to start addressing uh, how can we develop this technology in a proper way is to identify what are the different scenarios in which they can be used and make a difference between the present scenarios, the technologies that are ready right now to be used outside of the lab. And we can have some of them in, in the clinical sector that was mentioned earlier today, deep brain stimulation for people with Parkinson, certain activities that are commercialized for neuromarketing or for, for evaluating cognitive uh, processes in the workplace. They are in the market, not necessarily fully validated. Then we can have the probable and the plausible applications of this are systems that where we can see a benefit and added value of using these technologies but we have not yet cracked that entirely we don't know exactly if this is going to work or if this is going to be something that brings benefit for the users and the organizations that deploy them and also have a viable business model that allows these technologies to be deployed in the real world and then we have the plot the possible the ones that are in the long term there was those that enter into a border with uh, science fiction. We heard this morning about implantation of memories. We can all go to our favorite sci-fi movie to start identifying what these possible scenarios could be. So it's important that we take this into account when we, th when we think how can we develop 
technology, science, and how can we develop a governance mechanism for that? Not in the sense that we should only focus on things that are currently right here. We need to anticipate, but also we need to weigh in the level of detail that and the, the amount of evidence that we have that allows us to set a governance mechanism today for something that may or may not become a reality 20 years from now. <clears throat> A little bit about the risk we have talked about uh, with some of you earlier on. There are different types of risks. There are risks at the individual level. We talk about the, safe, the safety, that is something that comes with any consumer or medical uh, technology device uh, that, of course, is increased when we interact with a system that, uh, like the brain that plays a crucial role in our world. We can see here a picture of people who had a retinal implant. It was a system that was uh, place to interface directly with their um, optic nerve to send information to the brain to restore uh, certain capacities of signing. And the company that develops and was commercializing this, uh, these devices is currently going out of business. So what's going to happen to the people who had that? Uh, the changes that they experience by using this technology who are responsible from the co for, for the consequences that not having that available. Uh, will entail? And these are some of the questions that come when we think about the individual risks. There is, of course, the liability and responsibility of the, the companies, organizations that develop and approve this. And there are also new ways to uh, affect or threat our privacy by having direct access to our brain activity and potentially infer information out of that. And this is something that is in the possible realm. But nonetheless, there are already claims that this is already a possibility. So this is a risk that even if the technology is not there yet, we can have systems that are not fully validated, that are not fully tested, that are doing these claims, and then they can have specific and very concrete impact in the real world. And of course, when we try to see uh, how can we modulate and change the brain activity, for instance, to reduce the impact of a mental disease, we can have as well changes in personality, sometimes because we want, for instance, treating uh, attentional disorders, uh, but sometimes we can have a, an unintended consequences. So how can we deal with these type of risks? And we can have as well these societal risks, and then we enter as well in the privacy from the, from the individual to the collective privacy. Here we can see an example of an application that of using these technologies to monitor cognitive states in pupils. Uh, some of you saw this morning a picture of the same type of application with the example in China. And very often in these discussions, there is a geopolitical uh, angle to that. And sometimes the discussions enter between a certain dichotomy between the, the, the policies in one country versus the other. And that I think is important that we realize that there is not a single bad actor. There are many uh, potential misuses all across the world. And we can have other different aspects like the weaponization of these technologies. When I say we don't regulate, we don't control so far because we want to be at the leadership of such technologies. So how can we go and try to find ways to govern this? these technologies. Let's see what's going on right now. Uh, and one important thing to understand is that there are different mechanisms for the developers, for the users, and for citizens to uh, find ways to have a development that is compliant with what the society has agreed. But often, these mechanisms are not well connected. And if this is a picture from a perspective of a scientist that wants to share data, sometimes the requirements from the organizations, from the countries, from uh, specific uh, funders enter into conflict, and that becomes a burden. And there is a need, if we want to develop responsibly, both for scientists and for innovators, we, not, we need to have an integrated and coherent uh, toolkit of governance mechanisms that go all the way from international binding treaties and law all down to technical recommendations that are not binding, that are good practices, that are very localized. And it's very important that we don't focus all our attention in one of these, but try to look at what's going on at all of these levels, starting all the way up for international law. You heard some of you this morning about the Neuro Rights Initiative, but there are also these soft law mechanisms like the OECD or UNESCO recommendations, then technical guidelines, um, national law, and, and other. 
a very, very brief uh, uh, <clears throat> overview of what's going on in the last years. In 2019, the OECD released the first soft law instrument explicitly related to neurotechnologies, where basic uh, tenants come on responsible innovation, anchoring in the safety and inclusivity of these technologies, the use of uh, standards and capacity of oversight, and an anticipatory stance to what can come in the future. And here we are talking about a soft law non-binding mechanism. This is, of course, accompanied with a plethora of ethical recommendations. And at the level of international law and treaties, there is this proposal to change the um, Charter of Human Rights to include specific rights that are related to middle technologies. It's something that is now uh, being discussed at, uh, at the UN as one possible way to establish a framework to uh, guide the development of technologies. And uh, this comes from proposals about these, these middle rights that are still under discussion, not only outside of the scientific community, but also within the scientific community. And as I said, this should be complemented of things that help developers to translate this into actionable items in their daily life. And there we go on the good practices and standards, and there have been activities from different standardization bodies on specific standards for these technologies. We can see that we have very good toolkit for technical standards, but not very much for systemic standards or what we call right now social technical standards, those that take into account the ethical implications. So this is currently ongoing process that shouldn't be disconnected to the development of international so soft and binding law as well as national legislation. And, uh, <clears throat> and of course, we also have in certain sectors, the regulatory uh, aspects that are trying to find new ways to deal with these technologies. Uh, FDA, for instance, have developed what they call the leapfrog regulations. These are guidance, not binding, that is supposed to be uh, updated on at a regular basis with the dialogue of the scientists for technologies for which we don't have enough evidence to set binding regulation yet. And something similar is happening in the realm of artificial intelligence. So we have these different levels. We have these multiple instruments that is a complex solution to a complex problem that is certainly gonna fail if we don't have concerted efforts. And that's where it's important the work that some organizations are doing on trying to foster the dialogue across these different levels uh, of expertise, these different levels of agency, these different instruments. We can mention GCSP, this is part of the Polymath uh, initiative that I'm part with and trying to create mechanisms and channels for this dialogue like this event today, GESDA as well. How can we create a dialogue that helps us not to see what's going on today, what's going to happen tomorrow, and what can both scientists and uh, policymakers do for that? And another organization I'm involved with is the Confederation CLARE. It's an association of more than 400 AI research labs that is trying to push a human-centered development of artificial intelligence that is one of the enabling technologies for this one, and we will hear more about that later on today. And I'm going to stop here. Uh, very, very short uh, take home message in an anticipatory stance is key to not get surprises in the future, but everything that is developed needs to be integrated across the different domains of knowledge and across the different levels of agency that the governance mechanisms allows us to do. And in this complementarity should also include the different fields in which the technology is being developed. We see this gray zone between healthcare, uh, well-being and more regulated medical devices that can be a source of trouble if we don't pay attention to it carefully. And we're going to stop here with just an invitation to be pioneers exploring this new frontier of new technologies and the proper governance for it. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Ricardo, for uh, setting at the stage for probably a really good discussion uh, about um, first showing the complexity of the current uh, 
a different initiative on governance and your message about integration and having a, a coordinated approach to all of this. And the, that shows again, the importance of valuing more um, cross disciplinary thinking and also trying to break silos between disciplines and especially between those that are in engineering science and more social sciences. And we really need this uh, integration. And as you mentioned, JSRTCSP are actually working on uh, these issues. Thank you very much. For the viewer online, uh, if you have any question, you can raise your question in the chat and during the Q&A session, we will pick up some of these uh, questions. Uh, our second speaker is uh, Sandra uh, that will an, um, address us on uh, artificial uh, intelligence. Sandra, the screen and floor is yours. Thank you, Jean-Marc, and thank you for the earlier introduction. Let me just share my slides. Are we seeing those okay? Yes. Great. Um, yeah, so, so thanks everyone. Uh, pleasure to, to talk today a little bit about uh, AI um, and the misuse of the technology and governance aspects uh, as they stand today and what might be done uh, in the future. Um, so I guess the, just to, I'd ask to briefly sort of recap on an earlier presentation that we did around the weaknesses and the issues, vulnerabilities and how they might be addressed. So. Most people will recognize the consideration of bias, uh, the challenge that we have if we don't have good uh, data sets on which we base our models and we don't design our models appropriately uh, represents the problem that we're trying to solve. So bias is one uh, potential weakness of an AI system. We then also have the issue of brittleness. Uh, so where we have a model that's been trained to identify an object in this case, um, and if we slightly reorient up the object, then they can no longer correctly classify the model. And that applies across a, a range of different AI systems, this concept of brittleness, not being, not being able to uh, adapt to slight variations and so therefore being vulnerable to misclassification. Um, we also have an issue of what's called catastrophic forgetting. So we train a model to, to recognize or distinguish between uh, some objects in this case. Then we retrain it on some different objects and we, the, the model itself and the system can no longer go back uh, and recognize those original objects. Um, it requires some, some deeper and, and more complex uh, training to be able to represent this multiple uh, object differentiation. So current weaknesses in the, in the AI models. Um, and the final one that I'll highlight is explainability or the lack of explainability. So the case that for certain types of machine learning models, uh, in this case, deep learning, for example, we don't actually know how the model arrives at the decision it gives us uh, when we ask it to classify something. And that can be a limitation in certain environments and certain um, operations where it would be important to describe to the user or the stakeholders uh, why a particular decision was given. Uh, and that can apply, for example, in, in the legal uh, procedures and jurisprudence, et cetera. Uh, so there are several weaknesses. Uh, they are identified and there's a lot of research ongoing to try and improve some of those where they can be and improve the design and development of models for their, for their uh, uh, improvement. In terms of misuses, uh, this applies at a very range of levels. So at an organizational level, the organizational use uh, of facial recognition, for example, uh, and it was identified as a, as a misuse of some of these systems where the data sets uh, and the images that were being used to, to uh, train the facial recognition systems were actually uh, unconsented uh, in, their, um, in their capture. So that was a breach of Australian privacy law. And we've probably seen, you'll be recognized from media reports across uh, globally, uh, cities and, and, uh, uh, and or uh, states, at least in the US, and companies are, are actually moving away from the use of facial recognition because of some of these issues that have been recognized. Uh, another, uh, quite, quite a serious issue, uh, increasingly so, and we've seen in, in uses of this in, in the war in the Ukraine, uh, is deep fakes. So this is the idea of using a, a model to generate uh, images uh, with where you, where you input, for example, a different face and you create a fake uh, image or deep fake. And it's used for the purposes of misinformation. So you can create either audio or video still images um, to try and represent that somebody, some important, let's say, individual has said something that they may not have said. And then uh, you foster a discontent uh, and lack of trust in the actual uh, uh, reporting, for example. So that, that can be a, is a growing issue and the proliferation of the, the idea of deepfake as a service, for example, is, is a particular issue. 
The final one I've included here is this idea of uh, when we put the, or acknowledge, I suppose, that the, the AI systems and our development of them, we get to consider ourselves developing them for good, uh, but they also can be used by adversaries. Uh, and so in my particular field in cybersecurity and network security, we see their use by uh, adversaries within the targeting, such to, to, to uh, improve the efficiency of targeting attacks, of automating the attacks, um, to, to just increase the, the damage that can be done through, uh, through the use of AI. So that's another uh, misuse uh, of AI, for example. So where, where do we sort of stand with this? Well, there's a lot of reflection, uh, I suppose, similar to some of the things that Ricardo mentioned there. Uh, there are policies and principles that have been identified by a whole range of organizations uh, and, and companies. So we've got the OECD, there's also the professional associations such as IEEE and ACM, so for engineering and, and computing, that are putting forward principles and standards in the technologies. ETSI, the European Telecommunication Standards Institute, has put forward um, uh, mechanisms and frameworks around uh, mitigating some of the security issues, for example. NATO, for, for their um, or, organizational space, have proposed a series of principles as well. And, and then we also see the International Standards Organization looking at standards and principles. And the, I mean, it would be impossible to represent on here the hundreds of different principles and documents that have been proposed around AI. There's a move at the moment towards some more, as, as Ricardo mentioned, within the space, some technical standards around it, and also some understanding of potential uh, implementation of regulatory frameworks. So one that is close to us at the moment here in the EU, uh, by around uh, 2018, the first press release was put out about setting up an AI expert group uh, and a European AI alliance. And fast forward to, to last year, where there's legal framework for AI uh, and a proposal for regulation was put forward. And there seems to be increasing appetite for this based on some of those, uh, I suppose, the recognition of some of the vulnerabilities and misuses that, that might be uh, uh, applied with AI uh, and in the systems were depending on the deployment environment. So in this particular framework, uh, the EU are proposing considering the uses of AI and the risk level and categorizing them and then making requirements or applying requirements uh, for the fulfillment of uh, having documentation available so that you can audit and, and identify liability in the case of an issue with an AI system once deployed. Uh, in the US, uh, there's a draft Algorithm Accountability Act uh, proposed by the, the listed senators there and the representatives. And that's also looking at the idea of the, an algorithmic impact assessment. So requiring this kind of uh, control over how uh, systems are, are, are audited. Um, and I suppose it, this, if we're thinking about looking forward to how we apply things and, and considering how things are done in other fields, the, this would very much reflect on the work that's being done in the data protection space around privacy impact assessments and the requirement for those uh, to consider whether there's a privacy impact to whatever uh, your implementation is when you're gathering potentially sensitive or personally identifiable information, for example. So there are a couple of other uh, federal uh, initiatives in the US around an AI Bill of Rights, an initiative on AI and algorithmic fairness uh, that are also being developed, as I say, on the back of the, the, the existing appreciation for some of the, the misuse, potential misuses of AI. Um, I think it, it's, it's useful to sort of highlight the, the, the combination here. So there's a real push towards responsible AI, AI for good uh, and trustworthy AI, and really uh, understanding that we want to be able to take the benefits uh, that we can get out of uh, implementations of AI and AI systems, but not at a consequence for uh, for innovation or um, or um, development and entrepreneur, entrepreneurial activity. Um, so there's a balance to be struck between this idea uh, of innovation, development, uh, research, you know, pushing this forward, the field forward, and ensuring that uh, we are representative and we apply social and humanitarian um, approaches uh, to the development itself. Um, as a sort of wrapper, I think it's useful to, to highlight as well the, the Responsible AI Institute. I mentioned the fact that there are so many different principles and, and documents and proposals around AI. So the, the Responsible AI Institute has done a mapping, which is quite useful. On the left of the slide, you'll see a listing 
I mentioned the OECD and the principles there. So they capturing what the globally agreed upon principles are, looking at really today we're, we're concerned with the implementation of them uh, and how we might go about applying frameworks and then validating those frameworks. So ensuring that we've got these principles we recognize uh, most of the, even if they're different organizations are producing them, they're relatively similar in nature, reflecting the same sort of tenets. Uh, and, but then we need to be sure that we're actually able to consider how well uh, a system has adhered to them if they've tried to apply those principles. And the way that the RAI are doing it, they've got a global community of experts and they're applying them looking at their individual use cases. Um, and I guess if we link this back to the EU approach at legal framework, where they have the consideration of the risks and associated to different uses, the, the key here is looking at not just an environment or a particular um, field of use, but the individual, the actual uses or the tasks that the model is applying, is being applied for, the system is being applied for, and whether it's appropriate uh, to, to, the, to that. We were measuring the appropriate risk for a particular scenario uh, and system. So the REAI has also uh, proposed a certification, uh, and they have this first uh, independent accredited certification program. Um, so that they're they're looking at how, as I say, there's an objective assessment of some of these principles and how they're being built into, and the met, you know how how these uh, the validation can actually be, be achieved. Um, so this is a sort of I guess quite far on now. This is a good uh, implication of how we could actually validate and see where we're at. Um, but there's obviously an, a huge amount of work still to do. And one of the things I think that's uh, hopefully going to contribute to this effort is work where uh, Ricardo and I are both involved in this IEEE recommended practice uh, for organizational governance of AI. Uh, and apart from identifying the, the principles um, that, that apply in this space and clarifying those for this use, we're including those use cases as well and trying to identify for an individual or an organization uh, uh, looking at the governance aspects what that actually means in particular scenarios you know what questions do they need to ask i think one of the most important is the initial screening process where you look at the problem identify what the actual problem you're trying to solve is and then decide from the get-go is ai actually the answer because in a lot of cases it may not be and there's a lot of hype around around the use of ai and um, so identifying those hopefully this contribution which will uh, hopefully be published towards the end of the year will give another uh, look at it from the scenario perspective to how do you actually uh, govern the use of AI. So to finish up then, I've got a couple of um, points that I'd like to just uh, sit out, set out here. And I think sort of align a little bit with what Ricardo was saying around the future thinking aspect of it. So we have the, the sets of principles. We've got some standards there. We've got some regulatory frameworks proposed. Uh, but we, what the potentially, and in, in some place, I think they may be a little focused on the narrow AI. Uh, so the idea of the AI resolving a particular working well, a machine learning approach on a particular model, solving a particular problem. Um, but the, the direction of travel from a development and from a research or technical perspective is machine learning as a service. So the idea that you're not going to have, you can maybe tap into like the app store that you would have developed your Android app. You'll tap into this sort of um, machine learning model and potentially data sets, and you can build a system around it. So does the, do, do the principles, well, the principles are probably okay, do, do the regulatory frameworks hold up against that kind of a, an implementation uh, of machine learning or AI? And similarly, for systems that learn as they go, which is this idea of moving towards sort of a general AI perspective, how do they they work in that space? Do they actually apply? Can we use the regulation appropriately? Can it help uh, to solve some of the potential problems that might come down the line? And now I think of this is a little bit like a red team, blue team approach that we have in cybersecurity, where you have the, the proposer of the, of the, the, the system, uh, and then you have somebody trying to, to hack it or attack it and to find out what goes wrong. So if we look at these regulations and, and take some different perspectives on it and say, well, what if you did this? Would that apply? Would that work? Or do we still fulfill? Uh, can we still uh, identify uh, legal uh, responsibility, et cetera, uh, for example, out of that? So that, that's one approach to it, I would suggest, and I'm happy to, to discuss that further in the Q&A. And the final point I'd like to make is 
that we talk about uh, education and awareness, and it's hugely important, and it appears in the in the principles uh, uh, at various levels about raising uh, awareness of, of of AI and its use. I think that's not just in um, the domain of those sitting on the room and online here, but for all of the general public, um, we want to make it very clear. We want to remove this sort of idea of AI is some magic thing that only you know niche people should understand and be aware of. We want to make it very clear how AI systems work, where they're being used, and how they're impacting our lives, so that the, all of us uh, can contribute and we can get a broader um, stakeholder uh, involvement in the, in the uh, uh, approach so that we can have better uh, governance of the AI systems as we deploy them. So I'll leave it there. And uh, thank you very much. At least I can't. Um, uh, ethical standards. And I think your uh, last slide is very informative in thinking about development based on how the technology is evolving through uh, towards general AI and uh, do we can we apply the same principle that we're currently working on but also that when you have an ecosystem that is developing a new technology then you have also innovation in processes and that implies also new types of regulation you're referring here as ai or machine learning or therapies our last speaker kevin uh, will talk about synthetic bio kevin the screen and floor is yours are yours sorry I'm going to talk a bit about a more concrete problem, whereas, whereas both neurotech and <clears throat> AI are, are both, you know, have their applications, there's still very broad systems of development, broad fields that are advancing in many different directions. The same is true of synthetic biology. But the last couple of years have given us a very defined and concrete problem. <laughs> So I'm going to talk specifically about what we should do, given that our current ability in synthetic biology has put us right on the verge of learning how to ignite new pandemics. What happens if many people gain the ability to start new pandemics, potentially much more lethal than what we just went through? Is that a risk? Unfortunately so. Now, while I could talk about problems and governance challenges associated with synthetic biology as a whole, this one is becoming fairly urgent because today we know that pandemic viruses can kill more people than any nuclear detonation. And I'm using the nuclear framing here very advisedly because this has potentially similar consequences for international security. We know that we can't effectively block a pandemic virus at least we certainly failed to block the last one. And one can imagine a deliberately released virus, given modern air traffic, would be even more difficult for us to contain and eliminate. What's worse, many, many people in my laboratory, in my institute, at institutes throughout the world, can build viruses from synthetic DNA. So if we learn which viruses could cause pandemics, then they will become very widely accessible. Just today, the 1918 influenza virus is accessible to around a thousand times as many people as wield nuclear weapons. Now, 1918 being a past pandemic that spawned future viruses that still infect us today, it's highly unlikely to cause a sphere pandemic today. But what happens if we do identify some? Well, why are we in this? The number one cause is that we have very good protocols for assembling viruses. And of course, the bioeconomy, which is solving all kinds of problems and advancing us towards sustainability faster than perhaps any other field, nevertheless results in many, many people who can follow those protocols. It's been described as what now amounts to the world's best Lego set for assembling viruses and generating and testing new configurations. And the other piece is the availability of gene synthesis, synthetic DNA. The first synthetic virus that is booted up from a synthetic genome was made back in, in 2002, 20 years ago. Since then, the cost of the DNA has fallen a thousand fold. So today, if you wanted to order the DNA corresponding to 
1918 influenza virus, the raw cost to have all of the pieces shipped to you ready for booting up in a cell would be under a thousand US dollars. We kind of missed this. That is, some folks definitely saw this coming more than a decade ago. The industry has been moving on this, but our minds are not well tuned to anticipating exponential growth. So this really kind of crept up on us. Then the last one is what we don't know. The reason why there is no pandemic proliferation just yet. We don't know which viruses could cause them. What we do know is which sets of experiments could identify a virus as being pandemic capable or not. If we run these experiments and identify one, then proliferation is off to the races. That means that these experiments are kind of like the virological equivalent of nuclear testing. So if we use them and credibly identify one or more viruses as being pandemic capable, then we'll have this proliferation problem. On the bright side, if someone runs a nuclear test, you can, if it's successful, it can be done in such a way that the entire world knows that that state actor is now nuclear capable. That's not true with pandemics. The data suggesting that a virus is pandemic capable is very easily fabricated. So even though we might shudder at a world in which every rogue state and hundreds of extremist groups can all claim to wield pandemic viruses, threaten us, threaten the entire world with igniting new pandemics, they can't claim to have access and be believed because it's so easy to fake the data. The only way that they can make a credible threat is if the good guys run the experiments. And that's why translating from nuclear non-proliferation, a test ban treaty would be particularly effective because it doesn't need to bind the bad guys, the rogue actors, it just needs to bind the well-meaning. And unfortunately, many of my extremely well-meaning colleagues who desperately want to prevent something like the last few years from happening again are investigating natural viruses that occur in animals to try to learn which ones could now or could readily evolve to become pandemic capable agents. And in order to raise the alarm, they intend to share all of these in a list. This is a pastime that is shared among all nations. Most countries, most wealthy countries have funded some kind of research in this vein. And again, it's well-meaning. It's trying to save lives from natural pandemics. But life scientists are not used to thinking about security concerns. USAID, which funds one of these programs, was first notified that there might be a proliferation problem resulting from its work over a dozen years after it began funding research in this area. They really just were not aware. And the val expected value model suggests it's really not worth it. I can happy to address why in questions. But what we need to do is address this by talking more to one another across disciplines, especially folks in security and the health agencies. Because folks in the health agencies have no security training. And in most nations, there is no security advisor or any kind of security oversight of the kind of dual use research in the life sciences. We really do not treat pandemic virus identification, for example, as being more hazardous than fissile material enrichment. But when you look at the numbers, we should. What we do have internationally is a very strong norm through the Biological Weapons Convention that we should not be developing these kinds of technologies. The language is extremely strong, but of course the convention doesn't really have teeth. So a key question is, does Article 10, which says right to participate in the fullest possible exchange of information for peaceful purposes, does that cover identifying a pandemic capable virus and giving 30,000 people the ability to credibly threaten to unleash it. If it turns out that it does, then we really need another treaty. And again, a pandemic test ban treaty that forbids these kinds of experiments would be extraordinarily effective. The other thing that we can do is we can delay, we can reduce the number of actors who could wield these things. As I mentioned, tens of thousands of people can make influenza viruses that are infectious. 
Most of them, the individuals, rely on commercial synthetic DNA that they can order from a provider who doesn't check their orders to see if there's anything harmful in them. There's a, the remaining actors are governments which can make their own DNA. If we were to simply screen all commercial DNA synthesis orders, we would reduce the number of actors capable of wielding these kinds of viruses by a hundredfold. If we built a system that used cryptography to disguise what it is that we're scared of, then we could screen for nascent pandemic viruses that were identified by scientists who wouldn't have to try to warn the world of a particular harmful advance then even if a few governments knew, we would be no worse off than we are with nuclear weapons. In fact, quite a bit better. And cryptographic methods of doing this kind of DNA synthesis screening are being developed. It's a classic science diplomacy effort of which I am but one tiny part. And we're hoping to roll this out over the next year, which means that a year or so from now, the international community is going to have an opportunity to really engage with this issue and say, if this system is available for free worldwide, securely protecting the data of the order can screen global DNA synthesis, why not require it? Article four of the Biological Weapons Convention indeed compels signatories to take all measures to prevent development of these kinds of systems. So the nice thing about bio is that even though it presents these terrible risks, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. I've talked a little bit about how we can delay through a pandemic test ban treaty and universal DNA synthesis screening, but it's also true that we are, there are concrete plans for reliable detection and reliable defenses against the next pandemic. We just need a few years to develop them and put them in place. And I'd be happy to discuss a little bit about how in the questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, I cannot see people online, but I, I watch people in, in, in the room here, and, and your presentation was quite uh, eye-opening for a few uh, people in, in the room, and it's quite an achievement to, to do that because it's very hot today in Geneva, and so uh, you, you you really walk up uh, the, the, the audience. And also, uh, thank you for uh, showing uh, the importance of um, thinking about uh, the concept of security by design, developing technology where security is embedded from the very start into, uh, into development of this technology. <laughs>